been working with uh, some uh, members of the faculty here at New Mexico State University and putting on this uh, speaker series. Uh, this is the first event of an eight-part uh, speaker series that we're having uh, starting this semester and running through the spring semester. Uh, and it's uh, known as the New Mexico State University Climate Change Education Seminar Series, uh, otherwise known by the clever acronym NM Success. Thank you to Scott Ferenberg for uh, coming up with that. Um, as I said, this uh, series began last spring as a collaboration. And um, the, uh, by the faculty and by Senator Udall, uh, my boss, uh, it's just worth mentioning, is a, a vocal uh, leader in the Senate and calling attention uh, to the urgent need to address climate change. Uh, I don't mean to get political, uh, but that's just uh, uh, a, a good data point to keep in mind to understand why we're involved in this. Um, this series is at its core uh, an effort to make sure that our community uh, is informed and engaged in a subject that has broad implications for the future of the state, the region, the nation, the world, uh, in terms of uh, growing public health threats, uh, agricultural sustainability, wildfires, forest health, uh, water systems, um, migration patterns that could implicate national security uh, concerns, uh, and on the basic health of uh, animal and plant species that we all want to preserve for future generations. So this series is, in short, an effort to um, keep this conversation about how to address this uh, urgent crisis uh, alive and to keep us all engaged and, and hopeful. Um, with that, uh, I want to introduce our first speaker, David Hondala, from Arizona State University. He's going to be speaking to us today about his work in Maricopa County, which is home of the hardest large metropolitan area in the U.S. He'll be speaking about programs, plans, and policies related to adaptation to and mitigation of extreme temperatures related to climate change. Uh, David's research focuses on the societal impacts of weather and climate with an emphasis on extreme weather and health. And I'll just read a little bit from his resume. Um, particularly, he's focused on the impact of extreme high temperatures on human morbidity and mortality within urban areas. And his field work provides valuable insights for policymakers in, in Arizona. He's a senior sustainability scientist at the Julianne Wrigley Global Institute of Sustainability at Arizona State, assistant professor in the School of Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences a faculty affiliate in epidemiology and data services in the Maricopa County Department of Public Health, and he currently serves as a director for the Association of American Geographers Climate Specialty Group. Um, we're really lucky to have him. Just a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, we'll be speaking, David's presentation will be about 45 minutes to an hour. Um, David said if you have questions during the talk that you uh, really would like to ask, uh, raise your hands, we'll bring a mic to you so that uh, we can get this all recorded. Uh, and if you have questions that you would like to submit after the event, um, after his talk, I have got some index cards in the back. If anybody raises their hands, I'll, I'll bring you one and uh, we'll get those answered. And without further ado, David Hondala. Thank you, Renee. That's quite all right. <laughs> Super. Thank you, Renee, for the very kind introduction. Good evening, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be with you. Uh, special thanks to hosts today, Gary, Renee, Joni, Lisa, and I'm sure a few others whose names I forgot. It's really been a nice day spending time with, with all of you and talking about our experiences in our, in our different cities. And I'm hopeful that in our time together, I can share some of our experiences in Maricopa County, uh, both interacting with public professionals, planners, and decision makers, as well as with colleagues in the research environment as well on how we're thinking about a uh, future for our cities in central Arizona and cities across the Southwest uh, that is very likely to be a, a hotter one than today. As Renee mentioned, please ask questions. Uh, interruptions are fine. I, I'm just asked to bring the microphone to you. 
uh, when you make your interruption so that we can get your good thoughts on the recording. But please, uh, please don't be shy. And if uh, you're inclined to be on your phone uh, during the talk at some point, my Twitter handle will appear on the bottom of the slides. And if you'd like to tweet questions at me that you don't want to ask publicly, I'll be happy to follow up with you uh, over Twitter some other time. Uh, another bit of housekeeping, as I'm sure is familiar to uh, many of you in this room, uh, environmental health, biometeorology, geography, climatology, whatever the disciplines are that, that I might associate myself with, uh, is, they're very much a team game. And this is some of the team I'm privileged to be part of at, at ASU. And hopefully you see a number of you know, youthful faces on there. Uh, the, the students who I work with in sociology and global health and geography and meteorology are very much responsible for some of the good ideas that you'll hear. And then some of the older faces that you see, professors in climatology, engineering, sociology, uh, and others are responsible for some of the OK ideas that, that you will hear. Uh, you know, being a heat researcher, certainly it, it can be uh, some gr grueling work at times. You can see some of our team uh, waiting out at a bus stop there, ready to do some, uh, some, some surveys. And I'm just very appreciative to the team and our, our funders uh, that have uh, allowed me to perhaps have some interesting things to share with you today. OK, so the title of the talk is On the Front Lines of Urban Warming. And I'm hoping to share what our experience is like in a hot city, in the hot cities of central Arizona, as we're preparing for this, this warmer future. And I, I was thinking about what I might have meant when I wrote on the front lines. And I think this is the front line right here. This was about two weekends ago on a Saturday morning at an elementary school in a low-income part of, of South Phoenix. And you're seeing a discussion circle here. A group has been brought together by the Nature Conservancy in partnership with ASU and, uh, to some extent, the city of, of Phoenix to develop neighborhood-based heat action plans. And the idea is that these neighborhood plans, neighborhood-driven plans, will both inform local residents and guide local decision-making, but also rub off on what we're calling the grass, to, grass tops policymakers as well. And, and we're, we're really hoping to learn from these conversations people's day-to-day -day experiences in the heat that are perhaps not as well articulated or understood by policymakers as they could be. And there are a couple of details in this photograph that I think are quite interesting. The, the gentleman speaking, you might notice, doesn't look like most of the other people uh, in the room. He's, he's uh, larger than most of them, for example. He's a very tall man, much taller than me even. Uh, and that's Lance from the City of Phoenix Parks Department. And Lance is volunteering his time this Saturday morning to engage in a conversation with these residents almost all of whom in this photo speak uh, Spanish and uh, exclusively Spanish for, for about half the people in the room. And Lance is having a conversation with them about the plans for one particular park in their neighborhood that is being redeveloped uh, right now. And Lance has gone to this meeting to hear their concerns. And if you look very closely, uh, you might even be able to see that Lance is wearing a headset, listening to questions that are being translated to him from, from the audience. And I think, I think this, this is this, the spirit of being on the front lines of collaborating and, and listening uh, to one another and really getting the, the good ideas from the community that I'm hoping what we will come back to uh, through the talk. And of course, we're very grateful to the residents who participated in these meetings and, uh, and Lance from the city of Phoenix as well for sharing some ideas. This is a process uh, the Nature Conservancy has been leading to develop uh, locally based heat action plans in three different neighborhoods in the Phoenix metropolitan area. Unfortunately, uh, we are motivated to develop local heat action plans and citywide heat action plans because of the significant public health consequences uh, that heat has in our community. And although I will show you a number of statistics over the next 40 minutes or so, each of the statistics has a story behind it. And unfortunately, the stories can look like this one. If Rita's family members had known they would have dragged her out of the house as soon as they heard the air conditioning was out. And what, what the family members didn't know was that the air conditioner was out and conditions were physically intolerable for, for Rita. The Arizona Republic ran an interesting stories last, last summer chronicling the narratives of 30 people who died from heat-related or heat-associated causes the previous summer. And Ms. Ortiz was unfortunately one of those. This is a story that plays out too many times uh, in our community each, each summer. Here's another quote that motivates us to, to be in the room today. This is from a survey with elementary school teachers asking about 
how children do with the heat and are we talking about heat and, and do you ever see ch uh, kids having problems with heat on school property? And I thought this one you know, kind of sadly but also elegantly captures the nature of, of this teacher's perceptions of uh, how students are doing when they come back out from recess on a hot day, just like wilted flowers. And there's one more quote I don't have uh, 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 shown on the screen, but I think is also quite motivating from these Nature Conservancy workshops. We were talking about the experience of renters and how renters are more constrained in, in controlling their own environment and manipulating the landscape compared to owners. And if a landlord is absent or negligent or perhaps just underinformed, conditions can really become quite, quite dangerous or at a minimum uncomfortable for residents. And, and the, the one uh, woman speaking again about the experience of being a renter in the heat said, you can't control the weather, you don't own the land, you know people are going to die, and you hope it's not you. And I thought that was a pretty dark quote and aside from the health impacts that it implies, it also implies a sense of pessimism and hopelessness and a lack of agency. And it's that lack of agency that I'm really motivated by. When we're in these community meetings, especially the first meetings when we're there for the first time, I don't get the sense that there's a lot of belief among the residents of our area that things can be different when it comes to heat. I think the sense is, yes, it's hot, it sucks, and that is how it's going to be. And I think that doesn't have to be the case. I think there's a lot we can do to change the narrative about heat in central Arizona and in other locations. Heat affects a lot of people in central Arizona and other cities that aren't always well reflected in the administrative uh, records. These are data from different surveys that have been conducted in our area. And you can see from both numbers, somewhere between a quarter and a third of the population of our area says they have some type of significant problem with heat each summer. Either they report being too hot inside their homes sometimes or more frequently, or they experience adverse health effects from heat. And why do we have such a big number? We all are here in the Southwest, so I don't think it's any surprise to you that, that Phoenix is a, is a hot place. I was doing a little comparison of the climatology between Las Cruces and Phoenix, and I promise I'm not bragging when I suggest that Phoenix is a, a warmer place than Las Cruces is. Uh, it seems as though we are about a degree or two, uh, it's just a degree or two difference between your all-time record each month in Las Cruces and average temperatures for us in the summer month which I think makes Phoenix an interesting place for us to be looking to if we're confident that our cities uh, will be warmer. If the future of Las Cruces and other cities in this region looks like uh, the today of Phoenix, what can we learn uh, about the today of Phoenix? And it's not just places like Phoenix and Las Cruces that are having challenges with heat. Heat is a national problem. In fact, there was a, a story, I believe it was in The Guardian uh, three or four weeks ago, the headline was something like, heat is a national problem in the US. How did this, how did this happen? And we'll talk a little bit about how that happened today, I hope. Uh, some people are surprised to see these statistics. These are reported by the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And the rule of thumb I use is that for every 100 heat related, or for every 100 weather related deaths we have in the United States, about two thirds are related to cold, about one third is related to heat and everything else is essentially negligible. And you can see the numbers behind me here suggest that that negligible is a little bit more than negligible, but almost all of the cool weather that we see on television, all of the lightning, all of the flooding, all of the winds and thunderstorms and hurricanes, on average, add up to a much smaller public health burden, at least in terms of their direct effects uh, than extreme temperatures. And it's not just mortality that we're talking about, as I was suggesting. Here are current estimates for the Maricopa County uh, two summers ago when we reported what was at the time a record number of heat-related deaths, 155, 1,000 or more hospitalizations, 4,000 or more emergency department visits from, from heat. Uh, those are you know, relatively large numbers. And remember, each hospitalization and emergency department visit comes with dollar costs. Even if the human suffering doesn't motivate uh, you to be in the conversation, maybe the fact that a hospitalization costs on average $5,000, $6,000, at least hospitalizations related to heat, uh, perhaps that uh, motivates some public investment in these topics. Uh, I do want to make a, a brief note about the accounting of heat-related deaths, especially in light of the uh, conversation we've had in the public space about the number of people who died uh, from the hurricanes in Puerto Rico, uh, Puerto Rico uh, recently. You may have heard that there is some 
disagreement between different public officials about uh, exactly what that number uh, what that number was. And although I, I am not going to support one or another one of the numbers that we hear, the the fact that we can report different numbers for weather-related impacts is also true in the heat world as well. And I'll give you a couple of examples of that uh, here. In Maricopa County in 2016, we reported 155 heat-related deaths. In an average year in the United States as a whole, we report somewhere between 600 and 700 heat-related deaths. Now, I think Maricopa County is very important and very cool and very important. Uh, it's significant in the public landscape. but. I don't think Maricopa County accounts for 25% of the heat-related deaths in the United States, as those numbers would suggest. Another discrepancy, some years in Maricopa County, our local health department reports more heat-related deaths than the state health department reports for the entire state of Arizona, including Maricopa County. A logical disconnect. And this is because there are different legitimate ways to tabulate the number of people who die from heat in a given year. There are very conservative approaches that are based on administrative codes looking for particular ways that records are marked. And then there are more sophisticated methods like what we're fortunate in some ways to have in Maricopa County where any body that comes into the medical examiner's office that's suspected of possibly being uh, related to, to heat undergoes additional rigorous review. In Maricopa County, we do a really good job of counting our heat-related deaths relative to what's possible in the rest of the country, which uh, gives us a bit of a skewed perspective, perhaps, uh, on, on what the public health burden is of heat in our community versus the rest of the, the country. Sometimes these comparisons are difficult to make, and uh, I hope you'll buy the argument that if we're still figuring out exactly how to do the accounting for heat and health, we have a long way to go on getting the policies and programs in, face, in place that are going to solve the problem. So uh, take the next slide with a grain of salt then that it's difficult to do cross-city comparisons because here's a cross-city comparison. And I believe this is one of only two or three eye tests on the, on the whole presentation today. So I'm sorry if you can't uh, see this, this very well. Uh, this is from some researchers uh, based in Australia and the United Kingdom who have the largest globally consistent data set of, uh, for examining heat and cold related health impacts. And we're looking here at the percentage of all deaths in different cities that are attributable to high temperatures. And the vertical axis there ranges from zero to just shy of 1% of all deaths. And I highlighted the bars there for Phoenix and El Paso, which was the nearest city that was included in the study, uh, accounting for something like 0.2% uh, of, all, of all deaths. These numbers would suggest that Phoenix and its surrounds have about 60 deaths per year. I told you before that we have 155, so you can see the, the math problem is percolating through as well. But what I did want to point out on this slide is that you see Phoenix and El Paso, despite their position as very hot cities in the United States, are not on the far right side of the figure. There's not a one-to-one uh, one -one correlation between how hot cities are and the extent to which heat is a problem uh, for health in those communities. And we could have a long time talking about why uh, this pattern uh, plays out the, the way it does, and perhaps we'll have that conversation later, uh, but we won't have it uh, now. Just a couple more slides on the statistics of heat and health. This is not just a United States problem. We do have data available in other parts of the world uh, to understand how much heat is a, a problem there. Same group here, uh, uh, global analysis. The vertical axis here uh, is some sense of the burden of heat on, on health. We don't have to worry about specifically what it says. A uh, higher number on the vertical axis is worse. And the horizontal axis is some measure of temperature. Temperatures have been standardized here for these different uh, countries. Again, it doesn't really matter what they are. Farther to the right is hot, farther to the left is cold. And we're seeing here a classic relationship in the world of temperature health studies. There's this U shape that exists where there's some type of optimal temperature at which mortality is lowest. And then if we move colder or warmer than that temperature, we see mortality begin to increase. And you can see that the shapes are a bit different uh, from one place to another. And again, we could, have, we could spend an hour just talking about this, but, but we won't. I just wanted to make the point that people are studying the temperature health relationship in different cities all across the world. Now you might have noticed that the countries that we've seen on here all share some common characteristics. What type of countries are missing from this slide? Yeah, there are, there are almost no developing countries in most of the temperature health research. The, the perhaps dozen or so papers that do exist are, uh, tend to be limited to single case studies of particularly distinctive locations where 
long-term consistent weather and health records are available at the right time scale, accessible to researchers. And that will be a caveat for the rest of the presentation is that a lot of what I say is, in, uh, was, well, a, lot of, a lot of what I will say is informed by the rich temperature health literature that exists in the developed world, but there's a lot happening in the developing world that we are largely blind to at this point. So please keep, uh, please keep that in mind as we move forward. When we're talking about the, the effects of heat on health uh, in cities, there are interesting patterns as well. Here's a map of Phoenix. The actual geography here doesn't really matter. It's somewhat of an arbitrary geography on this particular map. I'd just like you to notice that there are different colors in different places. And the different colors here indicate what the heat, uh, what the mortality rate is on hot days compared to the mortality rate on less hot days. It gives us some sense of how sensitive different neighborhoods are to heat. And you can see that there are some places that, have, uh, that are colored red and other places that are colored green, suggesting that when we have heat events, some neighborhoods do better and some neighborhoods do worse. And this is a line of research that my colleague Sharon Harlan, who's a sociologist now at Northeastern, I think really advanced the conversation on in the early 2000s and as we turned the year in 2010, uh, bringing to light the idea that there are geographic uh, differences, disparities, we might say, in our experience with heat within cities. And this pattern is by no means random. This pattern is driven by both the physical landscape and the social landscape of the city. Sorry, this figure does not have super resolution. Uh, this is from a colleague, Daryl Jenneret at UC Riverside, who worked on the team with Sharon. Uh, speaking of the non-randomness of the pattern, this figure shows us the land surface temperature in different neighborhoods that were measured as part of a long-term survey, uh, survey initiative in central Arizona. And the vertical axis is the percent of households that self-report that they have heat-related illness. And you can see there's some sort of relationship there. And this is a story that we've seen over and over again in the literature for Phoenix and other cities in the Southwest and indeed across the United States. The neighborhoods where people are dying or suffering from heat at a higher rate tend to be hotter, tend to be poorer, tend to have higher percentages of racial and ethnic minorities, as well as some other uh, risk factors that might come to mind uh, for you. Yes? Yeah. To follow the procedures, would you please okay. re-ask your question? OK, good. Uh, David, those are presumed uh, remotely sensed temperatures because you never get an air temperature that high, at least. I hope yes, not. yeah. Thank you for your question. That's a, a, a very good point. That the numbers that you see here are surface temperatures that are measured by a satellite. And these numbers, uh, so uh, you know, just for a rough ballpark, we can consider a, a number in the low 40s to be equal to 100 Fahrenheit if you're not bilingual in the temperature space. Uh, yeah, so these are much higher than, uh, than air temperatures in most cities, Phoenix included. We don't have a sufficiently high resolution network of temperature sensors to really be able to assess uh, differences from one neighborhood to another, which is why researchers have leaned on satellite imagery to get a sense of what these patterns might be. There are certainly some, uh, uh, there's certainly a little translation that needs to be done to go from land surface temperature to air temperature. The patterns are not the same as, e as each other. It's not a one-to-one -one correlation. Perhaps some of you in this room are even investigating uh, that very interesting topic, but at least gives us a sense. Generally speaking, neighborhoods that have a higher land surface temperature are probably worse off from a heat, uh, heat perspective. Uh, and I, I do want to reiterate that this is not, you know, uh, while heat and health is perhaps most easily measured from looking at mortality and morbidity records, the connections between heat and health can be uh, simple and immediate or distant and complex. And here is uh, some data that suggests one of these longer term, more indirect pathways. Uh, so, so here's uh, some of the results from that hard work that students put in surveying people at, at bus stops and about their experience with heat. And you might not be surprised to see the result here. People who are at bus stops that have shade structures tend to report being more comfortable uh, than people who are waiting at bus stops that do not have shade structures. And you know, no surprise here, people are being beat. Uh, uh, being hit by the beating sun for 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes in some cases uh, in our city. So this is an immediate problem in that we have some bus riders that might be uncomfortable and surely we'd like to try to improve their quality of life. But what if some of those people are very hot 
decide that they're not interested in taking the bus anymore. Maybe they'd like to resort to a Lyft or Uber or a taxi or an electric scooter to get to wherever they need to go. All of a sudden, that quarter mile, that half mile walk that that person was making two times each day is out of their daily schedule. And that conflicts with some of the goals we have in our region and other regions about walkability and active transportation, which we understand to be a strong determinant of your risk of chronic diseases later in life. So now we've taken these people who we might first think have an inconvenience of not having uh, no shade shelter at their bus stop and all of a sudden uh, worsened our efforts to improve the walkability of our city and ultimately reduce the risk of chronic outcomes like heart disease and so on. This also uh, speaks to our strategy for making investments in active transportation and public transportation in the city of Phoenix, which is often perceived to have a poor public transportation system elsewhere. And in some regards, those perceptions could be correct as a person who lives there and experiences that, uh, that, that system. Uh, but the city of Phoenix voters uh, just a few years ago passed a $30 billion transportation tax that aims to improve roads, increase bus frequency, expand the geographic coverage of our light rail system, and make some other improvements. If people are too hot to walk to the bus stop, can we imagine the public blowback of $30 billion in stranded or abandoned uh, assets? That doesn't seem like a, a, wide in, a wise investment. So we need to be thinking about heat and health you know, very broadly in the city. And uh, this is new research that's just out. I just thought this was kind of, uh, kind of interesting. I don't know if you saw this one from this group at MIT. They were looking at some other ways that heat affects uh, some of our health and public policy decisions. And I know the figure is not particularly uh, beautiful. It looks good when it's really small in the journal article. Uh, so th these researchers at MIT looked at the association between temperature and the probability that uh, health safety inspectors will do their job and actually conduct an inspection. And they looked at the probability that those inspections will produce a violation. And the yellow line is the probability that a inspection will actually be done. And you can see that that probability goes down at higher temperatures. So when it's hot, inspectors are doing their job a little less frequently. And that's a problem because of the green line, that at high temperatures, they're more likely to find problems. So we're going to have a bit of a, what they call a regulatory gap here, and that when it's hot, we're missing the problems and those problems are occurring more likely. So the heat and health web becomes uh, even more complex and interesting uh, for us. And if you are one of those uh, inspectors, uh, please let us know how we can help you be cooler uh, on, those hot, on those hot days, because we are counting on you to keep us safe. Okay, uh, so that's uh, some general context about heat and health. I'd like to now transition to talk about urban heat and some of the patterns uh, that we have seen and think might be coming uh, thinking about regional climate change. But before we do so, uh, perhaps a good time to see if there are any questions or, or comments, reactions uh, to some of what we've just seen about heat and health. Thank you, sir. Well, I was, I was actually struck by your first slide with the group of uh, community members at the school. Do you have any members on your team or otherwise doing research on the problems of heat versus learning among students? A, a, a great question. Th th thank you for it. Uh, we do not currently, but that is a topic of, of interest that has come up in a few circles. The state health department uh, is interested in this topic, as is the county health department locally. The state health department has invested in a heat safety toolkit for teachers and school nurses, and in subsequent survey work have found out uh, that that heat toolkit is having limited impact, uh, shall we say. It's a set of resources that you can download from the internet. So I think there's an appetite for this conversation. And I think there is some evidence elsewhere in the literature that suggests an association between temperature and learning outcomes. If you're sitting in a hot classroom, you might not learn as well as if you're in a, a comfortable classroom. Uh, so definitely something for us to, to look at. Thank you for your question. Yes, I wonder if you could opine about what you would think the relative differences between direct and indirect effects of heat are between developed and, um, uh, and developing countries. It seems like the developing countries would have far more indirect effects. Yeah, I think I agree with you, although I'm certainly not an expert on you know, many matters uh, in developing countries, food systems and so on. I would think that, that complications for food production, uh, water sanitation and so on would outweigh the direct effects. The point has also been made to me in some of the developing countries that have the 
lowest life expectancy, and uh, sorry if this is a bit you know, morbid to, to talk about, uh, heat in the developed world tends to be a problem that affects older people more than it does younger people, and in some countries where the life expectancy is relatively low, other causes of death might be more important in the, the life progression. Uh, pe people, the way it was explained to me is that people might not get to the age at which heat is going to be uh, the cause of their ultimate demise. One more question, perhaps? Okay, well, let's talk about urban heat uh, a little bit. And you know, some of you are likely familiar with the, the concept of the urban heat island, and Phoenix is one of the cities that has been most studied uh, anywhere in the world for understanding what the urban heat island is. Before we move on, I do want to uh, see who's in the room. How many students are here? And how many students are in some type of climate or weather-related discipline? A few of you. Okay. Very good. And uh, other students, what type of programs are you from? Just shout them out. Government. Government. Oh, very cool. Thank you for being here. Geology. Geology. Thank you for being here. I hope I have something interesting for you. Biology. English. Biology. Wonderful. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So we have some students in there. Many faculty members here. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I know we're all very, very busy people. Very busy, but nice of you to be here. Uh, I, I got the impression we might have some folks coming from city, county, state government. Thank you, Lisa. Much appreciated. Representing the entire political system of New Mexico. Any, uh, any community members, local professionals who are here just to, to hang out? Yeah, super. Yeah, thank you, thank you all. For, yeah, thank you all for being here. So the urban heat island might be a familiar topic for some of you, maybe a little less familiar uh, for others. And we're not going to talk a lot about the physics of the urban heat island today. But the general idea is that because of the way we've built our cities, and this is true in Phoenix, Las Cruces, Los Angeles, almost every city uh, we could dream up, uh, temperatures tend to be higher in the center of the city than they do in the surrounding areas. And this effect is not negligible. This is not some minor discovery we've made as scientists. This is a real phenomenon that people experience in their daily lives and tell us about when we ask them if they've noticed changes to the city uh, over the time in which they've lived there. <coughs> Here's a, a, I'd say this is a moderately intense urban, uh, a, a moderately intense urban heat island on this, this hypothetical you know, day here. This is just a cartoon, as you might be able to tell. Uh, 10 degree difference between Sky Harbor Airport, which is our official weather station, uh, right in the center of the metro area and another weather station out on the suburbs in, in a place called Queen Creek. 10 degree Fahrenheit difference in the mean temperature. That's the average of the max and min. The effect in the overnight hours for minimum temperature is larger. The effect during the day is smaller. Here's what a time series of temperatures might look like at those two locations. I'm just trying to present the same information a few different ways to hopefully convince you this is a, a real phenomenon. Uh, again, daily mean temperatures here, Queen Creek in green, Sky Harbor in gold. You can see that the gold line is higher than the green line. But also, interestingly, the difference between the gold line and the green line uh, varies a little bit as we move through the year. And here's what those differences look like. Here's what I would call the urban heat intensity, the difference of the daily mean temperature between those two locations. And you can see that the average here is somewhere around 6 or 7 degrees Fahrenheit, although it reaches up to uh, 12 Fahrenheit at a given time. And pardon me as I relocate power here to ensure we can keep on going. Uh, the urban heat island effect tends to be most pronounced on calm days, cool days, clear days, when we've had a chance to have a lot of solar heating uh, in the environment. And in some places, it's been reported that the urban heat effect is at its strongest. Backup is always a good strategy. The urban heat effect is at its strongest uh, during the winter months. But we see an interesting pattern in Phoenix in that some of our summertime days have the strongest urban heat effect. You can see that some of the days, if we look at the daily mean temperature at Sky Harbor Airport here on the horizontal axis and the intensity of the urban heat effect on the vertical axis, uh, some of the days when that urban heat effect is really cranked up at its strongest 10, 11, 12 degrees Fahrenheit are our hottest days, which is, of course, exactly what we don't want. We don't want the hottest days of the year to be ones when we're really putting the burden on people who live in the urban core. 
Now, uh, there is a, a, a large community of researchers who are very passionate about exactly how we define the urban heat island effect, what stations we're using, what time of day, and uh, we're just not going to get into those nuances here. I think the general principles that I'm sharing uh, are agreeable, although some of my colleagues might uh, argue with me about the nuances of this particular uh, approach. But no one would disagree that this is a real effect that people notice uh, in, their, in their daily lives. Temperatures have changed in Phoenix over the past several decades, just uh, you know, similarly, similarly to how they have in other locations. We've seen an increase in both daytime and nighttime temperatures, but Phoenix has this distinctive urbanization effect, which shows up in those nighttime temperature records. The math experts in the room can tell us that the difference, the change between uh, minimum and maximum temperature is much larger for minimum since 1950 than, than, uh, than for maximum, four or five degrees uh, see more warming at night than we've seen during the day. And this is uh, the very distinctive signature of the urban heat, uh, urban heat island, which affects our minimum temperatures because of the way that the built environment responds to uh, heating. Some of, uh, some of my colleagues are looking at what urbanization means for the future climate. And we're looking here at results of a climate model that has changed the landscape of central Arizona from its contemporary configuration to one that is more developed, has uh, the metropolitan region covering a larger area and that metropolitan area even having more dense development. For those who are familiar with Arizona, this particular scenario creates one uh, giant metropolitan area uh, in which Tucson and Phoenix are nearly contiguous, and they are separated now by some extent uh, of desert. So this is a pretty, uh, pretty high growth scenario. And the colors here represent the amount of warming that's projected to occur for daily mean temperature as a result of urbanization alone. We often hear about warming coming our way from global scale climate change, from a adjustment to the composition of the atmosphere. And I think we hear this story less often despite the fact that I would argue these processes have been the dominant drivers of warming up until today. Local change, land use change, land cover change has been the dominant driver of changes we've seen in the temperature record up until now and could play a substantial role in the temperature record uh, moving forward. These projections uh, are for the end of the current century here under this high growth scenario. So that means we might have more to worry about, which I'm you know, sorry to say, both urban driven warming and global driven warming. And an interesting question one might ask, and my colleague Matej Georgescu has asked, is how do these two effects compare to one another? What will be more important? What will be a larger contributor to future warming? Global climate change or regionally uh, driven climate change from urbanization? And the comparison of those two is what's shown on this slide. The colors here represent the ratio of urban driven temperature change to global driven temperature change. Red colors mean that the urban signal is dominant. Green colors mean that the global signal is dominant. And you can see two maps here. One that compares a high growth scenario for the Sun Corridor, Central Arizona, to a relatively tame emission scenario. This is from the old set of emission scenarios for those who are familiar with the different uh, scenarios we use in climate modeling, the B1 scenario, uh, a relatively aggressive mitigation scenario. So we have high growth and we have a lot of climate mitigation happening in this combination. And you can see that the urban signal dominates. Urban driven, urban driven warming accounts for more than two times the effect of global driven warming in this particular combination. But in a different combination, low growth versus high greenhouse gas emissions, the A2 scenario, the opposite story is true, that the global signal tends to dominate uh, in that pattern. So the exact answer, as we scientists seem to be good uh, at saying, are that it depends. And in this particular case, it depends on exactly what trajectory you follow in terms of uh, local growth which I think is you know, very important and encouraging because that's something we really have our knobs on as local policymakers and global greenhouse gas emissions, which we are hopeful to control, but of course is a much more complicated uh, story. And just to give you a little bit more data to hopefully convince you that this is you know, somewhat uh, of an interesting process, the lines here represent the distribution of temperatures. The vertical axes are uh, temperatures in degrees Celsius. The vertical axis is some sort of density measure here. These are uh, just histograms. You can imagine them uh, for different temperatures. 
The colored lines are our different growth scenarios. The black line is contemporary, and you can see between the high and low growth scenario, the colored lines get pushed to the right to the higher temperatures of the black lines when we run these different scenarios moving forward. So we have a lot of confidence that urbanization is going to change uh, the future climate of central Arizona. And this pattern and other modeling were conducted by Maté uh, and other colleagues across the country and indeed the world uh, show that the urban effect could be a significant driver of regional climate change over the next few decades and beyond. This, of course, fits into the larger story about climate change that we've, you know, uh, I believe we've already talked about in this series and we'll talk about again uh, in, in future seminars in this series. We're looking at a lot of warming coming our, our way, even under a relatively low emission scenario. These projections here are specific to Arizona and are specific to the 10th hottest day of the year in Arizona, which roughly corresponds to how many times we issue heat warnings in an average summer. And even under a low or emission scenario, as we approach the end of the century, our 10th hottest day will be four degrees Fahrenheit warmer than it is today. Those days are in the high one teens right now. 122 is the all time record and these projections suggest that our 10th hottest day would eclipse the all time record by the end of the century. So what does this mean for public health? It, you, know, you probably don't need a PhD to you know, think that there's a pessimistic story to be told here. And indeed, there is a pessimistic story that is being told, even being told by President Obama and his administration in a report they released a few years ago. Uh, they said that extreme temperatures linked to climate change could cause an additional 11,000 heat-related deaths in our country in the summer of 2030. Pop quiz here. What did I say earlier was the number of heat-related deaths that we have in the United States each year today? Yeah, 607. Uh, outstanding class. Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> so uh, increase by more than an order of magnitude by 2030. That's a large increase. Surely this is some, uh, you know, some hocus pocus, uh, pocus the liberal Obama administration is concocting to drive climate policy, right? No, they're just looking at the scientific literature. This is a figure uh, from some researchers at Columbia uh, that projects the number of heat-related deaths for the city of Philadelphia moving forward in time. And the, the details are not really important. There are different time periods on the horizontal axis, and there are a different measure of mortality on the vertical axis. But I'd just like you to see that the bars go up as we move into the future, regardless of the emission scenario. And if, you know, if you're doing some math in your head, you can see that there's uh, perhaps an order of magnitude change projected for whatever the measure of heat-related mortality uh, is that's on the vertical axis here. Researchers have told this story time and time again. It's very easy to find these papers in the literature that suggest there will be order of magnitude increases in the number of people that are dying from heat in cities in the United States and elsewhere over the next several decades. I think I saw a question. Yes, let me figure out where the microphone went. Thank you, Joni. So these projected increases, are those direct effects or do they yes, include? So, yes, uh, great question. Thank you for that. These are definitely the direct effects uh, only. And I'll put a, a caveat in that this is one of one particular one of the particular accounting methods for getting the, those direct effects. But yeah, this is, this is suggesting something like the numbers we've heard from Puerto Rico, the number of excess deaths that there are associated with heat events, even if they're not all individually labeled as being directly heat related. Uh, the media has uh, observed this research as well. It's not hard to find headlines like this one, as Earth warms, heat related deaths will multiply. And the media has realized that Phoenix is a hot place where that headline could really resonate. A building, bloom, a building boom and climate change create an even hotter, drier Phoenix. The city faces a reckoning. Think Death Valley, but with subdivisions. Now, I think there's some type of implied rivalry between Los Angeles and Phoenix. And you'll notice uh, the particular media outlet here. Uh, that was casting that light for Phoenix, but they're not alone. Uh, even our own local paper, this is from the Arizona Republic. Phoenix's heat is rising and so is the danger. Our heat is getting worse. Or you could just go for the bold headline here. Phoenix will be unlivable by 2050. 
thanks to climate change. And you can even find a quote from me in this article. And I think I'm a supporter of Phoenix, and um, that is not the impression you would get from, uh, from reading this article. Keep Vice in mind. We'll return to Vice uh, later in the, the story. So, so you can see the pessimistic message about heat and health uh, moving forward. And I don't think this is an uh, exotic or elaborate argument. We know, I think I showed several figures that suggest there's a direct relationship between temperature and mortality, and you can find similar figures that suggest a relationship between temperature and morbidity. Temperature up, health risks up. It seems logical. Other researchers have been thinking about and looking at how the relationship between temperature and mortality has evolved up until the present. They've taken a retrospective approach uh, to examining the problem. And these researchers tell a much different story. In New York City, for example, the relative risk of heat-related death declined from 1.26 in the 1970s to 1.09 in the 2000s. Seoul, a decline. Stockholm, a decline over the 20th century. Italy, a large decline after a heat plan was implemented. Australia, two-thirds less heat mortality today than at the start of the century. In the United States, the number of heat attributable deaths down 63% over the 18-year period 1987 to 2005. In almost every published study that exists, the number of people who are dying from heat today is smaller than the number of people who died from heat in 2000, than in 1990, than 1980, 1970, and so on. The most recent study is from that same group I mentioned based out of Australia and the United Kingdom. Uh, in this particular study, they had access to more than 20 million mortality records spanning 272 locations across uh, six or seven countries, a statistically significant decrease in the relative risk of mortality in the majority of countries included in the analysis. And when there was no decline reported, there was no effect reported. No countries were moving in the other direction in what we'd argue is the wrong direction. And these headlines are not as compelling but they are good news. So far, more heat waves do not mean more heat deaths. It's hard to find headlines uh, that, that refer to this literature. At least that's been my experience anyway. If you happen to find any, I'd be, uh, you know, be very happy to receive them. So we have some researchers who are looking at the historical record and telling us that something is getting better. For some reason, despite warming that has occurred, significant warming in some locations, Heat is having less of a public health effect today, at least a direct in terms of a direct effect on mortality, than it was in the past. But other researchers, and in some cases even the same researchers, are telling us that as we look forward, we have order of magnitude increases to be concerned about. And here is my attempt to uh, illustrate uh, that, that literature. The risk or incidence of heat-related death or illness, uh, this is what some researchers are saying, today to the future will go up. Nearly every prospective study suggests dramatic increases. Retrospective analysis tells us a different story. The, uh, this figure is not to scale, I will note. <laughs> Historical uh, analysis. There are a few interesting papers that suggest perhaps the decline would have been greater in the absence of warming. Perhaps we could have been, been doing even better had it not been for some of the warming that we've observed. So there is that, that, uh, that hypothesis out there. Uh, and other literature tells us, you know, this is of course not a straight line, it's, it's some sort of wiggly line we've bumped up and down over time, and we'll probably bump up and down going into the future. But nearly every retrospective study reports declining sensitivity to heat. And I would say this is some type of projections paradox that we as a community have to solve. Is this right? Are we really at some societal inflection point in the developing world where we've maximized our adaptive capacity? We're doing the best we ever can in terms of coping with heat? Are our historical models underinformed? Are the future models underinformed? I do feel pretty confidently at least about that last one because you can find language like this one in almost every one of those forward-looking studies. And if they don't have this sentence, I'd say the article shouldn't have been published. We did not consider effects of human adaptation or heat mitigation measures on future heat wave mortality. This means that every ounce of effort Lisa is putting into trying to making the city cooler and to try to make you safer is not going to succeed. 
All right, this says that every effort that we are making as a community to do better for heat is going to fail. And that could be true. It's not going to be true here because I know she's a very talented woman. But, but this is a, a very constraining statement to make in our uh, analyses. Similar to some other work, we've assumed that excess mortality from future heat will be the same as heat wave mortality at baseline. At a minimum, you might think this is a funny assumption to make because we've just discussed that every retrospective study shows that our sensitivity to heat has changed over time. And if you were of an optimistic bent, you might think we have a chance to change uh, adaptation or mitigation measures moving forward. As a disclaimer here, I, I'm of course picking on some of my unnamed colleagues here who wrote uh, this sentence, and I in fact have written this sentence myself in, in some papers uh, uh, looking forward. And the reason we have to write this sentence is that we're not very good at modeling future adaptation. When Lisa runs an education campaign that encourages you to have a water bottle as you're going around the city or helps there be more shelters at bus stops, and then I'm running some elegant statistical model that relates climate change to heat-related health records, I don't know how to include that education campaign in the models. It's very awkward uh, for us to do right now. And this is a challenge, I would say, that, that we in this community need to take on. Researchers are saying we can't handle adaptation in these future models, so we're not going to worry about it. But adaptation is happening, and we ought to figure out how to measure it. And we need to learn how to do it better so we can achieve our health goals, our equity goals, and help our cities thrive. I think it's interesting to think about the case of Phoenix, then, in that light, in that there is a question, at least the literature suggests a question, if we've reached some societal maximum in how we can cope with heat. Phoenix and the Phoenix metro area is the metro area in the country that experiences, the, the, is the large, among the large metro areas is the one that experiences the highest summer temperatures. So if we're thinking about reaching some upper limit for adaptation, Phoenix might be a good place to look to because Phoenix is experiencing warming first, if you will. The canary in the coal mine analogy uh, might be appropriate, although Vice has used that in their stories that you know, I'm not wild about. Uh, so let's, uh, before we get into the county health department data here, uh, let's think about what some of these adaptation measures you know, might, might be. Why do we think we're doing better uh, in terms of health effects from heat today than we were in 1985? What are some hypotheses in the room that are out there? Why are fewer people dying from heat today than did 20 years ago? And, and uh, just shout them out, I'll repeat them here for the recording. Air conditioning, there's more air conditioning, and maybe it's even more affordable today than it was 20 years ago. Air conditioning saturation has indeed gone up in the United States. Compete, uh, conflicting results in the literature on this hypothesis. Some researchers seem to definitively link a decline in heat-related mortality to increasing air conditioning availability, whereas others say that relationship is weak at best. Maybe air conditioning, maybe not. What else could there be? More people are indoors. Yeah, this is a hypothesis that I'm particularly passionate about. Perhaps we're changing our exposure. And here I'm not using this uh, you know, kind of back of the envelope concept of exposure, meaning the temperature that's measured at the airport. I mean the real exposure that you experience as a person as you move around the city. Maybe we as a society are experiencing lower temperatures today than we did 20 years ago because we're inside much of the time. Statistics suggest something like 90% of our time uh, indoors, and we probably all have a feel like that number is increasing, although I don't know that literature very well. So perhaps our exposure patterns have changed. Of course, really hard to get a solid data on that, but I like your hypothesis. Improved medical response. Yeah, thank you, Gary. Uh, gr uh, great idea there. Uh, it turns out we're dying from almost every cause at a lower rate today than we were 20 or 30 years ago. You know, axe to forehead was more likely to kill you in 1975 <laughs> than it is today as was cancer and heart attack, although in some communities and within some demographics, recent data suggests that, that maybe we're, we're stopping those declines or moving in the other direction, uh, which is a separate conversation. But yes, perhaps, uh, perhaps the health system is better, perhaps our health care measures are, are better. More urban tree planting? More urban tree planting, yeah. Perhaps the spaces where we are in cities when we are outside are more comfortable, safer for us to be than they were in the, in the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, plausible ties into the exposure idea. One more, perhaps? Yes? This is, this is much a question as it is a gas. Is there um, uh, like a, a increased likelihood that those who would be most at risk, like seniors, might actually just move in the summer? Like, might be more dramatic. 
Yeah, very interesting idea. People are maybe going to cooler locations in the summer months getting, uh, getting out of the heat. I think that's an interesting idea. I don't know the answer to your question. When I think about the population growth we've seen in the sun belt or the heat belt, you know, I wonder if the general migration to the, to the south would offset some of those patterns. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. It's an interesting idea. I see one more eager hand here. Also a question. Yes. Yeah, good, good, good question here. The question is, if we divide the urban landscape into strata based on income or perhaps other variables as well, do we see similar patterns? I don't think I've seen those analyses done, and that might be related to the type of information that's available in the large-scale data sets. I'll have to think about that, but that's a really interesting question. More energy efficient building materials. More energy efficient building materials being used, which maybe is helping us be cooler inside, maybe helping us save money to buy our other heat cooling things or be happier or healthier. Is, is that where you were heading? Surfaces that, yeah, so surfaces that don't, so again, changing our exposure. And Lisa, for the last word. Yes, are attributed to other Oh, interesting idea here. So maybe, yeah, maybe uh, we're cooking the books a little bit here, intentionally or not intentionally. Uh, I, I feel like, if anything, in Maricopa County, the opposite might be happening, that, our, that we are becoming more hypersensitive to heat, and heat is in our public discourse, which perhaps in the medical examiner's office makes it easier to flag cases for review. I'm, I'm not sure. I think this is a good hypothesis for us to explore. I'd also suggest that efforts like issuing uh, heat warning messages or having a heat action plan in a community have possibly had an effect. There is some evidence in some places that suggests that some of these types of intervention measures have been successful, although this is a very hard type of evaluation uh, to make. But we are at least hopeful that uh, the efforts from our colleagues at the National Weather Service and public health agencies are making a difference in changing behaviors that are helping people stay out of harm's way. So thank you for those interesting ideas about adaptation. And now let's think about them in the context of the hottest large area uh, in the US. And have we maxed out our adaptive capacity or do we have room to go? Uh, as a Interesting consequence of being such a hot place, the Maricopa County, De Public of, uh, Maricopa County Department of Public Health is probably the national leader in tracking the health effects of heat in the, in the community. The uh, officials from the County Health Department and our State Health Department, for that matter, lead and sit on many of the national working groups related to measuring the impact of heat uh, on health. And because of that investment that we've made as a community, we have this interesting time series of heat-related uh, death data to, to work with. And here are what the data look like locally uh, for the first 10 years the period uh, the system was operating. You can see that the numbers go up and down between you know, roughly 40 and 100 or 110. The average over the first 10 years was uh, somewhere approaching 80. But then an interesting thing occurred in 2016 in that the number skyrocketed. Uh, this figure is, in fact, slightly outdated. The number was revised upwards to 155. And you don't need to be an expert in statistics to realize that's a large increase. It's more than two standard deviations above the previous 10-year average. <coughs> and it's something like an 80% increase above the previous 10 years. And as people who work in you know, the, the heat and health space, this certainly caught the eye of our team. Uh, it's discouraging for, for one. There are a lot of people working very hard on the heat problem in central Arizona, and this is exactly what we don't want to see. But from an a academic perspective, and probably from a practice perspective as well, we're curious to figure out why this happened. What was responsible for the spike in 2016 relative to previous years? And if you're a statistical purist, you're going to be unhappy over the next few slides because we're comparing one data point to 10 data points. Uh, hard to draw a trend, hard to draw a solid conclusion, but I think the outcome of the analysis might at least give you occasion to say, hmm, maybe there's something there. Uh, so 2016 was hot in central Arizona. Uh, here's one of the headlines from the Republic. Uh, heat killed more people in 2016 than ever before. Here are other headlines, record warmth. It was the second warmest June on record. There were many individual days that were the record for that day of the year. You know, for example, it, was, it might have been the hottest June 3rd on record or the hottest July 17th. Uh, I think the, 
the June-July period was the sixth warmest and, and onwards. You could, there are many ways to characterize it as a, a pretty warm uh, summer, and the media uh, picked up on this as well. So we asked the question, perhaps the record warmth contributed to the spike in 2016. How much of that excess, which is indicated here by the, the, black, uh, the black box on the yellow bar there, that would be the excess number of deaths in 2016 relative to what we would have expected. How much of that black bar could have been attributed to the record setting heat? And I will spare you the uh, methodological details, but we created a series of statistical models based on the relationship between temperature and mortality for the period 2006 to 2015. And then we tried to predict the number of deaths that should have occurred in 2016 based on the observed weather. So we have a model that is trying to predict how many deaths there should have been in 2016 given the weather that we saw in 2016. And those predictions are shown by the gray symbols. We had a couple of different models. The details of those models are not important. What you can see is that the models largely agree for 2016 that it should have been a roughly average year. The weather in 2016, although it was record warmth by some measures, our models suggest should not have led to a spike in heat-related deaths. In fact, if anything, they suggest that it should have been slightly lower uh, than other years. And we can uh, break down the meteorological record in a number of ways, one of which I will do uh, uh, here uh, uh, now, but there are, there are a number of different ways that the nuances of the story suggest that the record warmth should not have been particularly problematic from a health perspective. One way to think about this is to contextualize the long-term record versus the number of years where we've been operating the heat surveillance program. So when we think about the entire meteorological record, 2016 definitely stands out. 2016 is one of those dots on the far right-hand side of the figure, and compared to 100 other years, 2016 was exceptional. Uh, for the uh, May through October period, perhaps it was the fifth warmest year on record out of 100. Quite exceptional, right? But remember that the heat surveillance program has only been operating since 2005, which takes our year that was the fifth warmest out of 100 and makes it the fifth warmest out of 10. The entire period that the heat surveillance uh, program has been operating, the, the whole period has been exceptional. 2016 doesn't stand out so much compared to the other years around it because 2015 was also very hot and 14 and 12 and 11 and 10 and so on. It's also the case that in 2016, we didn't have very many of the super, super hot days in Phoenix. We, we were missing a few of the 118, 119, 120, 121 degree days that have been experienced in other years. And those are the days that really cause the model to predict a high number of heat related deaths. So, so the nuances of the way the day today weather pattern played out led us to predict a, a lower number than the historical average. So it seems unlikely to us that the weather is to blame in this particular case. What else could it be? And these are some of the mechanisms and processes that I suggested our community and me individually are not so good at modeling. How do I capture the uh, fact that Lisa's distribution list about you know, being safe for heat like crashed and didn't work in 2016? How do I get that into my model? And that did not happen. This is just a hypothetical uh, scenario. So we looked at a number of different data sources to try to figure out what might be happening. And this was more of a descriptive analysis than a rigorous statistical analysis. Sorry again, statisticians. But here are some patterns we saw in the health records on the left-hand side and in some other data sets or in our mind on the right-hand side. And I'd pay more attention to the top row here than the bottom row. We saw that the share and total count of heat-related deaths among individuals classified as homeless skyrocketed in 2016, an increase of more than 30 in our data set. And that's 30 out of 100, an uh, increase of 30 in a total number of 155. So that's a really large increase for individuals experiencing homelessness who are also dying from heat. In the same year, when our regional uh, planning association conducted a point in time survey, counting how many homeless people there are in our community and if they're living in shelters or not living in shelters, they reported a 25% increase from the previous year in the number of unsheltered homeless individuals. And we do not have the individual narrative of every homeless individual who died from heat 
in 2016. We didn't have monitors on them to understand their personal exposure. We, we don't know very much about them at all, in fact. But I think it is at least possible that these two numbers on the top of the slide go together. If we have more people who are out in the elements in our community who have access to fewer resources to stay safe, it seems awfully likely to me that they would have a higher risk of dying from heat. So when we're thinking about patterns in the heat-related mortality records, I would be reluctant to make this argument, but I think this argument might be true. And this is a really uncomfortable space for me to move into as a temperature health researcher, because I don't know hardly anything about homeless programs and homeless shelters. And it really speaks to the need for collaboration around this particular topic, that to, to really figure out what's going on here, I probably need to call someone whose department I don't even know the, the name of. And you know, I, we'll talk about this here uh, in just a few moments. H how do we create a, a space and a governance model where we're really able to have the right people together to, to diagnose these problems? I'll stop there and see if we have any comments before we move into our last segment. Yes, there is a question here. Thank you, Joni. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I just saw a talk last year by Time and McPherson about urban heat in New York. And what was extraordinary was the variation within New York in overall heating. So, I mean, you want to live in Central Park pretty much. I know that real estate costs. But uh, I wonder if there's the same level of variation in Phoenix, which lacks a lot of leafy trees, et cetera, and whether just choosing sort of averages from the center point of the city is giving you the complete picture of where there might be real hot spots that might engender particular risk. Yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, I don't know the specific answer if New York has a wider temperature range in the summer or Phoenix does, but I think we're at least in the same ballpark in terms of the variability. And you are absolutely right that I am, uh, uh, when, when, when folks like me are running these models, we are really under-informing them by using airport data. Nobody lives at the airport. You're not even allowed to live at the airport. So, so nobody's experiencing the conditions that there are at the airport. Uh, and, and that is work that people are be, you know, beginning to, to take on, is trying to understand how the intra-city variability in our heat exposure, or at least in outdoor temperatures, affects differential uh, outcomes. So that's certainly work that's being pursued I don't, it, you know, it's hard for me to think about how that pattern could play out here because the change from one year to the other is so large. I could certainly see it being the case that over a period of 10 or 20 years, uh, let's say poor neighborhoods are becoming hotter, we could see these numbers moving in the wrong direction as exposure becomes worse in our most vulnerable communities. Uh, but I, I would need to do some more thinking for how, you know, how that, unless our, our more vulnerable neighborhoods got really, really hot from you know, 2016 compared to 2015. Maybe water rates went up and all the trees died. And it, you know, I'm not sure exactly what the story would be. Uh, but it, it's interesting to think about. And your point is well, well taken. Perhaps one more. No, that's OK. Yeah. Yes, please. Well, this is just a simple question. When you look at these statistics for, for climatological, do you take into consideration humidity? Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, we could have a nice long discussion about that as well. So the, the question is, what, uh, what parameters are we thinking about to capture the temperature effect? And this particular topic is one I'm you know, very passionate about. I'm going to keep my answer short uh, so we can move uh, along. At the level of the individual human body, there are a lot of variables that are really important to measure to understand if your core temperature is going to increase and if you're likely to have heat exhaustion or heat stroke. And those variables certainly include the air temperature and humidity, but also radiation from the sun and from surfaces, air movement, exertion level, clothing, fitness, age, and so on. Speaking of the environmental variables in particular, uh, it's fascinating to me that when we feed in all of those variables to generate a more complex measure of temperature, maybe the heat index or maybe something even fancier like uh, uh, some German researchers developed the universal thermal comfort index. That's the, yeah, it's the universal one. It's the best one. Those, mo uh, those variables don't always create a stronger relationship with mortality than temperature alone. And that's particularly the case in Phoenix where we have 
tried to dream up every combination of variables possible. Daytime temperature plus nighttime humidity plus yesterday's sunlight plus if the Diamondbacks won. And it's really hard for us, and they have not been winning recently here at the end of the season for those baseball fans. Very depressing. We can, it's very hard for us to beat daily mean temperature in these models. And why that's the case? Because of the strong rationale at the individual level is a, a, a mystery to me. I think there's a lot of noise in our exposure that we don't know how to measure yet. Uh, but thank you for the, the question. OK, uh, so I wanted to end by talking a little bit about what's happening in Phoenix, thinking about some of those adaptation measures, thinking about some things we might be doing well and some things we might be not doing so well, and tie this up by highlighting what the city of Phoenix is hopeful to do moving forward. Originally, uh, these were the you know, top 10 things Phoenix is doing to battle the heat. But now I think they're more like 10 interesting things Phoenix is trying to do to battle the heat. And we might see some of these as positives uh, or negatives. Uh, so air conditioning was mentioned early on and often comes to mind and is probably the reason Phoenix has a population of greater than 50,000, let's say. Population of the Phoenix metro area is 4 million. We have a lot of air conditioning. People can't necessarily always afford air conditioning through the summer. People tell us they have constraints uh, in their air conditioning use. People are dying from heat in their homes. Remember Rita Ortiz from our, our first or second slide? Uh, air conditioning is everywhere. We even have to play sports in, uh, in our air conditioned buildings there, uh, the NFL stadium and the Major League Baseball stadium there. Uh, not everyone can afford air conditioning. Their home or has access to air conditioning in a, a workplace. We have a network of publicly available cooling centers. There are several dozen facilities that open their doors for heat relief in the summer months. We visited many of these cooling centers in 2014. Uh, the sustainability-minded folks in the room will be very disappointed to hear that each day in the summer, this network distributes something like 2,500 plastic water bottles that have been <laughs> donated. That's, uh, yeah, that's a lot of water bottles over the course of a summer. Maybe some of them have saved lives. Interesting sustainability trade-off here. Maybe we can put reusable water bottles in this, in this system. Cooling centers serve our best estimate is something like 1,500 to 2,000 people, uh, although we can't say that all of those people are only using the cooling centers to, to cool off. But there is an effort to make uh, public, more public spaces available to cool off. I mentioned reporting and surveillance. Uh, excellent programs in Maricopa County and Arizona to, to track. One of the quotes from uh, former New York City Mayor Mike Bloomberg is, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And at least in central Arizona, we're doing a pretty good job measuring some of the health effects of heat, which gives us a chance to manage it. Education and messaging is probably important, but we probably have to do more work to understand how really to influence behavior other than providing uh, you know, fact sheets and websites. But there's a lot of effort from the Weather Service, from the health agencies and, and others to get the word out about specific, uh, specific techniques you might use. And even just this weekend, ASU researchers are going to be out collecting data on physiological response to provide more specific guidance to the city of Phoenix for how much water people should be taking with them uh, when they go hiking. Uh, heat alerts. We do issue heat alerts, heat warnings as they're known uh, in our jurisdiction. They might have different names elsewhere. This is a new product from the National Weather Service. New, uh, it's been in existence for a couple of years now called Heat Risk. We have a problem in the hot cities of the Southwest that we can't issue heat warnings on all the days when they're deserved. In central Arizona, we would think there are something like 100 days every year that pose health risks beyond some, some baseline level. And we can't issue 100 heat warnings every year. Warning fatigue is a, a real phenomenon that has been discovered uh, and reported in the hazards literature over and over again. The heat risk tool aims to help us overcome that problem and a few others where instead of providing warning or no warning, we provide more of a categorical message. Sometimes we can hit the big warning message, but other times we might have a medium level uh, warning day. You can see the, well, you can kind of see the names of the different categories there. Uh, this was the heat risk map for today uh, in New Mexico, as you can see. And we were not in the no elevated risk category. That would be green. We're in the low risk for those extremely sensitive to, to heat. This is more analogous to the UV index. Uh, the way we report wildfire danger, for example, even the um, you know, perhaps somewhat failed terrorism risk categories from a few years ago uh, in the, the post 9-11 years, uh, trying to indicate that there's some risk 
even on days that we don't have heat warnings. Regulations, a difficult topic to, to take on, but I have started to hear an appetite or at least an interest in the room with policymakers in the city of Phoenix to think about what regulations might look like from a heat perspective. I think in some ways heat is analogous to air quality uh, in terms of how it manifests as a hazard. It's everywhere and sometimes it's worse than other times. We don't really notice it very much. It adds up to a large health burden, but it's sneaky and silent in the background. And in the case of air quality, we have laws and we have people dedicated to ensuring that our cities stay below national ambient air quality standards. We have, in fact have whole agencies that are trying to keep the air in our cities clean. I'm not suggesting we're gonna have the national ambient heat standards. I don't even know what that would look like or, or how it would operate, but are there regulations? What is the regulatory space we need to play in? Is this in planning and development? Is this in outdoor recreation? This was a, uh, interesting conversation that played out in Phoenix a couple of summers ago. We have, uh, unfortunately, we have to make uh, dozens of rescues on our trails in this, the summer months. And in Arizona, where there's certainly somewhat of a libertarian spirit, maybe in parts of New Mexico as well, the idea that the government might control your access to public trails did not go over well with all parties. And you can see a quote here that was reported in the media the statistics do not bear out that we need this rule that takes my rights away, uh, one gentleman said. Uh, you can see that the city was discussing if they should close the hiking trails. They ultimately reached an interesting conclusion between the option of keep the trails open in the summer months or close them for the summer months or maybe some summer days. So those were the options, trails open or trails closed sometimes. They decided that the solution was that dogs would not be allowed on trails. This is not a joke. Dogs would not be allowed on trails days that were 100 degrees Fahrenheit uh, or warmer. People on trails or people not on trails, those were our choices. And the answer was no dogs on trails uh, some days. So we are still uh, exploring what we can do in the regulatory space. But I've started to hear more and more uh, from some policymakers uh, who you know, might be interested to explore what can be done. Uh, active canvassing and outreach is a really important uh, response strategy that's in place in our community. This happens from city government and from uh, NGOs and not-for-profits as well. And this summer I was so excited to see an idea come to life that had been kicked around for a few years. That's illustrated on the right photo with the volunteers in the green shirts. Can anyone think of a uh, volunteer group that wears green shirts and helps with response? CERT. CERT, yes. So for the first time in Phoenix, thank you. CERT is the Community Emergency Response Team. These are volunteers that are trained to help uh, come to your home in, in the immediate aftermath of a disaster before the first responders can get there because the first responders can't get to everyone who will be in need. CERT volunteers have basic training like understanding uh, how to turn off gas, how to provide very basic first aid, how to identify if your home can be inhabited or not inhabited. And for the first time, uh, to my knowledge, in Arizona, this summer, CERT volunteers were deployed to help with heat. This is great for at least two reasons. One, it's more people helping us get the word out about heat. Uh, but uh, for those of you who know the weather of central Arizona, until the monsoon season kicks in, when you have some thunderstorms, if you're an emergency response volunteer, there's not a lot to do in May and June and July, unless we had some act of you know, terrorism or something like that. We're, in Phoenix, we don't have hurricanes rolling through. We don't have tornadoes rolling through. We don't even really have rain for that matter. And in the emergency response literature, we know that a, a, a volunteer or a responder who's not responding is atrophying. They're losing some of their response capability. So here we're able to activate the CERT team in the summer month to do something which, keep, which keeps them fresh, it keeps them involved, it keeps them interested, it keeps them ready to go for the next event, and also helps uh, reach some, some folks who may be in need. Here you can see they're distributing uh, water. Sorry, Joni, plastic bottle there. Uh, and, uh, and some as well. Uh, we have some interesting cooling infrastructure in Phoenix, and I know uh, Las Cruces is pursuing more cooling infrastructure as well. Uh, this takes all different sizes, shapes, and forms. We have an aggressive uh, tree and shade master plan in the city of Phoenix that calls for increasing our current tree canopy cover to 25% by 2030. The current tree canopy cover is approximately 12%. 
three and a half percent here locally. Now, there's one funny thing about trees is that they need time to grow. So I am becoming increasingly concerned that our goal that is now just 12 years away uh, may be tough to meet. We may need to import a lot of trees uh, very, very quickly. And it's not only about trees, certainly having manufactured shade as well. Uh, you can see a shade sail there over playground. That particular shade sail is actually oriented uh, improperly. That shade sail tilts toward the north, which is not where the sun is. The <laughs> sun is to the south. Uh, at one of our light rail stops there on the top left, we have a cold air button. You hit that button and cold air comes out. That's pretty cool, uh, I think. And then a lot of these evaporative misters at bars and restaurants as well. Uh, do we have the cooling infrastructure in the right places where people need it? To some extent, but we could do a lot better. Emergency response plans. Uh, we do have some plans. Uh, they don't make for particularly great uh, slides, but there are plans in some, uh, some books. We do not necessarily have heat-specific plans across all of our agencies. Uh, FEMA has adopted for a number of years now an all-hazards approach, with, uh, which some scholars in emergency management think is uh, maybe suboptimal. You might want to plan for heat differently than a, a thunderstorm. Uh, and we are glad to see some jurisdictions in our area move to generate more heat-specific plans. And, and perhaps where the university researcher really fits into this conversation is knowledge exchange and creation. Uh, we help some of our colleagues at the Weather Service, health departments, and others organize discussions. We have a statewide heat meeting now uh, every year. This will be our third year uh, next spring, having a statewide heat safety planning meeting, just to get folks in the room to talk about what they're doing and hopefully see some conversations uh, go on after that. Arizona participates in the CDC Climate Ready Cities and States Initiative, which means we produce some statewide reports about climate-related risks to, to public health. Uh, uh, even uh, in some cases, we have the opportunity to collaborate outside of the state boundaries. We were really uh, privileged and fortunate to have the chance through a NASA project called DEVELOP to work with Lisa and her team uh, to use some NASA Earth observations to help try to inform some of the greening goals for, uh, for, the, for the city here, providing more specific and actionable uh, heat uh, data. And I think seeing this conversation continue and expand and grow is, is, is critically important, and I hope you would all agree. How is this conversation moving forward? This is the last little bit uh, here, I promise. Uh, here we are in Phoenix City Hall talking with mid-level managers about how Phoenix could manage heat better. All of the different initiatives that I've been describing, uh, well, many of the initiatives I was describing are pretty good. They are you know, somewhat effective. They've developed over a number of years. People have put a lot of effort uh, into them, but it's, it's probably more by happenstance than planning that we have all these different programs in place. They've largely come to light in an ad hoc, one-off manner. We don't have a, a systematic framework for figuring out which intervention should we be deploying. Does it make more sense for me to spend an hour of my time as a city worker to go get more water bottles for the cooling center? Or should I be going and buying umbrellas to hand out to people who are walking up and down the street corner? We don't have a, a, an architecture for making that decision. And that's what we're talking about uh, here uh, with the city of Phoenix. How do we make decisions? Even who's in charge of heat in the city? If there's a problem with crime, you know who to go to. You might write an angry letter to the police commissioner or something like that. You at least know the, the title of that person. If you have a heat problem in Phoenix, who do you go to? There's not the Department of Heat. We have a sustainability department. They're somewhat involved. So we're talking about that here. And what we have developed, co-developed with the city of Phoenix is the idea that we might be able to create some sort of program like the National Weather Service Storm Ready Program that provides a template for how cities might be able to holistically manage heat in their communities. Storm Ready is a very successful program that's been implemented in 2,700 counties, cities, universities, corporations across the country that ensures that the lines of communication are open between that entity and the National Weather Service, ensures that there are appropriate evacuation plans, shelters, and so on. This campus is Storm Ready, and this county is Storm Ready, uh, in fact. And we are curious what an analogous program would look like for heat, because having the uh, having the backup batteries for your weather radio to handle a storm-related power outage may not necessarily propel you to think about what your cooling infrastructure is 20 years from now. We think what it would take to be heat-ready does not perfectly overlap with what it would take to be storm-ready. 
And we're really happy to have had the chance to start to develop those ideas through the Bloomberg Philanthropies Mayor's Challenge. This is a national competition for cities to pose uh, innovative ideas to take on their most pressing challenges. And in this competition that, that took place earlier this year, uh, cities posed solutions for problems ranging from uh, youth violence to drug addiction to recycling and air quality to a few climate related challenges, including heat. Phoenix was the only city that submitted a project related to heat. And perhaps, well, Phoenix was the only one of the 35 selected cities that submitted a project related to heat. Lisa has a comment here. This is year one for Phoenix being selected for this, but if they expand and are the, the big kahuna in this, Las Cruces and another city uh, in the southwest will, will roll out uh, and, ch and, uh, and, and try this program out in our city. So. Thank you. Yes, great. Yes, great plug. So the, the process here is that many, uh, many cities submit ideas. 35 were selected to test out their ideas. Phoenix was lucky to be one of those 35 champion cities. And we spent the summer testing out our ideas. This is what testing our ideas looks like, according to our, our photo team. Uh, and five of those cities will be selected in just a month to receive grants of $1 million or one city $5 million to build out the program in detail. And we're so happy for the potential collaboration with Las Cruces to test out the model of a heat-ready city uh, here and in Phoenix uh, and elsewhere. And because of that work over the summer, we were really happy to see this Vice headline that certainly reads a lot differently than the one I showed a few slides ago. Instead of unlivable, maybe there are lessons being learned in the hot cities. I think we could replace Phoenix here with El Paso and Las Cruces and the other cities of the Southwest. Maybe there are lessons learned and to be learned that we could share uh, elsewhere. As my last slide, I think those lessons really need to start with our residents. This is one resident of a public housing project in, uh, near Central Phoenix who was drawing for us what she'd like to see on her walk to the bus every day. And because of her comments, the city actually invested in one of those solutions this summer. And her smile was even bigger when she saw the temporary misters in place at the bus stop that she'd been asking for uh, for years. Are we going to have a city of misted bus stops? I'm not sure about that. But can we have a city that's more responsive to residents' needs and desires and, and finding solutions for heat? I think so. I look forward to figuring that out with all of you in the years ahead. Thanks. Thank you, David. I think we have time for a few more questions. You've all been really good about asking them. Go ahead. So we've been talking about the direct effects, and Bill certainly brought up the indirect effects. One thing that's hitting here, uh, certainly in the next 10, 20 years, and even now, uh, is the spread of vector-borne diseases as overall, not just regional uh, warming comes in. But I was thinking, with the heat island getting so hot, Kathy, Henley, is she still here? Is it going to be too hot for mosquitoes? <laughs> Right, but that's humid. I mean, we're frying you know, 130 degrees and uh, low humidity, is, can they sustain that? Uh, if we keep watering, they'll be fine. Ah, well, too bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, urbanization can take on, this is related to a previous question. So urbanization can take on different topologies, right? So in Phoenix, it's been mostly horizontal, whereas like in Manhattan, it's been vertical. Do we know enough about this to know what sort of the optimal topology is to mitigate some of these effects? I think the answer is closer to yes than no. Uh, I am not the expert in the, the geometry of the, the built environment and how that affects our thermal comfort, but the, the community of researchers who are in that space uh, can provide recommendations for optimal building height to canyon width ratios uh, and so on. And you're right that Phoenix looks a lot different than Manhattan and other cities, and in some ways is challenged by that really horizontal uh, spread. So I, I, think, I think it would not be a stretch to think that uh, researchers in this space can provide very tangible recommendations for, for builders, and then it's a matter of if that agrees with our, our policy and desirable aesthetics. Yes, thank you for your question. 
Hi, um, I'm a Hi. PhD student here and my research is focused on water availability and water sustainability. Yeah. So you can probably guess where I'm going with this. Yeah. Your projections We have show... plenty of water and there's no problem. <laughs> right, exactly. Your projections all show significant heat gains with growth. And I know that growth is the American way. All of our projections show significant losses in water storage specific to the Southwest. And that rate only increases with urbanization and population growth. So how does your heat plan rectify a future with significant water loss? Yeah, so th thank you for your question. And there are a lot of really good questions embedded within her question that we definitely don't have time to get through uh, today. I think, uh, yeah, I think we need to tread carefully in that while, we'll th while, while we think we are being innovative and in bringing departments together to talk about heat, we also don't want to be siloed in talking about heat without being aware of some of these potential trade-offs. Phoenix is in an interesting place right now in that we are still converting land from agriculture to residential. And in terms of a, a water, from a water consumption perspective, residential land use is much less demanding than the crops we have been growing in Arizona. So right now, uh, some of my colleagues tell me we have a little bit of a buffer built in is that as we're converting ag to residential, we're actually saving water. How does the heat plan explicitly? Yes, <laughs> and you're very observant, thank you. Uh, uh, yeah. How does the heat plan factor in water use explicitly? I know that, that there are guidelines for tree species selection to ensure we're choosing you know, drought tolerant trees, trees that have lower water demand. Are there going to be incentives or regulations to move away from other consumptive water uses? I, I can't. I, I can't say. I feel a little bit out of my comfort space in the policy domain for water. There is, you know, if, well, well, if you might have the impression that we have a lot of heat researchers at ASU, the number of water researchers dwarfs uh, them. So I might not be able to give justice to your really good question. But maybe we can continue the conversation later, unless you want to ask a clarifying question. I, I think like that your question is very important, and I don't have a great answer for it. Yeah, well, so I can tell you for maybe one little bit uh, to, to make you happy is that we are, we, are, we are definitely studying misters way more than I ever expected. <laughs> and we can talk about misters in great detail. And I don't think we'll have a city of misters at bus stops. Yes. So I realized that we're just talking mostly about urban warming. And I know that there's a lot of factors considering, like, the ideas to, like, prevent it or to restore cooling temperatures and all that. And I realize it's more in like mega cities, such as like New York and then um, your hometown, for example. And I just want to know, can we able to use these techniques that we're preventing urban warming? Can we able to adapt that to smaller cities and towns so it could be like a global like idea, I guess you would say? In, in principle, yes. Although we were talking about this uh, a little bit earlier today that the the infrastructure that exists, both like, like the physical infrastructure, the stuff, as well as the, the people, is just of a completely different scale in these small cities. So, so if, you know, if we wanted to implement the heat plan in a small city of 5,000 people, like that might be two hours of someone's time for a couple weeks, and that, like that's, that's it. That's all we have, because they're running the whole city, because the staff is only 10 for city government. So how, how we do so procedurally? is like a really interesting question for our government scholar. Maybe that was you, or maybe someone who was sitting over here. Uh, a dwelling of even one by itself can make changes to the structure to help cool the surrounding landscape or help the building in, inside be cooler as well. So the, the principles of, of mitigating heat in the city can be applied to smaller settings. But figuring out who takes those actions and where the money comes from to take those actions you know, I, I need help from go government scholars there and economists and so on. And you're right, this is a very urban-centered uh, talk. We have a lot of uh, research charge at ASU to think about big cities, but the pro this is not a city problem exclusively. Hi. Um, so there's been an idea suggested that we could um, reduce the urban heat island effect by possibly coating large open surfaces like roads, uh, parking lots, rooftops with something that's less efficient at absorbing the heat. Is that, would that make an impact and is that even economically feasible? Yeah, th thanks for the question. I don't know the answer about the economics, but it is, it is feasible and cities are beginning to test these ideas. Phoenix has had a relatively successful program of painting roofs white on city-owned buildings 
which is just a drop in the bucket in terms of all the roofs that exist in, in Phoenix. City government has a lot of buildings, but you know, really small in the, the uh, entirety of the city. I would be cautious about reflective surfaces at ground level. Uh, not only do they potentially make it brighter and a little more uncomfortable from a visual perspective, but having a bright surface on the ground also reflects more uh, solar radiation to the body that could be contributing to heat gain as well. So uh, th this is one of those cases where all those variables that you were thinking about before, uh, it's really important to think about them because we could paint a road white or gray, and this is happening in Los Angeles right now, and the surface of that, uh, the, the temperature of that surface may be lower, and even the air temperature above it may be lower, but the thermal environment it's in, in its entirety may be worse for a person who's walking on it. Does this matter for a large parking lot that people walk on for 15 seconds a day and that's it? Like, like maybe that's the perfect space to do this, but I think, I think the details are still being, being worked out there. And Phoenix and Maricopa County are starting, uh, they're willing to experiment when we now hear that parking lot seven on 7th Street is going to be redeveloped. Do you want to try some coatings there? And I think, I think seeing cities willing to experiment in this space is a good first step. So thanks for the question. I don't think I perfectly answered it. But. So I had a similar question, but what I was, <coughs> excuse me, I'm losing my voice. What I was wondering is you're telling us that we're developing agriculture into more residential area. It in, seems in an immediately, yeah, so an immediately actionable regulation more than say closing trails for heat danger would be an albedo standard, right? So if you're gonna have continued development and we know that reflectivity is an issue, is that something that's been explored so that building materials have to have a particular level of reflectivity? Uh, it seems much easier to put in place now before you build these locations than to wait until you do these tests. Because we know your models about how these urban heat islands will affect warming are based on albedo. Yeah, ter terrific question. <clears throat> Thank you. I think, um, yeah, so I'm not a city council person, nor am I directly you know, in contact with city council folk, folks every day. But my sense is that some of the policymakers and city staff may have started thinking about starting to think about something like that. Um, yeah. What that looks like and what the resistance to that will be is, is yeah, yet to be uh, known. You know, it is like it is, I've only recently started to recognize that the idea of a heat ready Phoenix carries some political weight uh, to it. And this is one of those areas where you know, it is a little more expensive to paint, uh, you know, to use material A versus material B. And maybe instead of building in Phoenix, I'm going to go build in Las Cruces because they don't have that regulate. You know, that, it gets interesting very quickly. To, to, add to, that, to add to that question, the issues within the city have to do... The issues within the city have to do more with both cost burden, that's um, a disparity issue that exists, uh, is, is, one of the, is one of the main factors that, that we play in, and, and then how... Um, antiquated our design standards are and that as we move forward with new versions that those sorts of factors will be put in. Energy efficiency is for new construction but not for old. So. Yeah, thanks. It's great to have somebody here who understands how government actually works. <laughs> any, any last questions? Thank you so much to uh, David. Thank great, all of you. Great thought-provoking talk. Don't you, shy away from yelling at me on Twitter if you're uh, if you if you feel free. Yeah, and thank you guys for all the great questions, for being so engaged, and for coming here again. Uh, for information about future uh, events in this climate change education seminar series, please look at uh, NM Success Number One. NM Success One. Uh, dot wordpress.com. The next event is October 3rd with uh, Isabel Montañez from uh, UC Davis. Her talk will be on deep time insight into Earth's future. Uh, and if you'd like to um, give us your email address, we can uh, notify you about future events. Feel free to uh, contact uh, us through the uh, website. I think we can. Um, if you have any suggestions for, for future events or future topics. so And, and you can tweet at NM Success, right? Yes. Yes, follow us on Twitter. All right, thank you so much for coming. <laughs>